Okay, cool. Put in my phone as well. Should we record it? Yep, cool. Three, two, one. Okay. So, Dimitri, uh, great to have you on the show. Hope you're safe and well in these times. We're speaking virtually via Zoom, of course. You're in the US. Tell us um, what are you up to these days? Uh, Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, taking it easy and having a little Dr. Pepper um, and uh, having a Zoom uh, Zoom conversation with you. Yeah. Now, is um, California your permanent home now, or do you still sometimes go back to your hometown, Moscow, to live? No, I, I live more in Moscow at the moment. Moscow. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Had to come back and take care of a couple of things. So. Right, and talking about the U.S., you moved to um, the U.S. from Moscow for tennis when you were 12 years old. How vividly do you remember? How vividly do you remember that moment when you left Moscow and arrived in the U.S.? Uh, well, I mean, I don't remember too vividly, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I came from Moscow, and you know, it was '95. Um, I think it was like around September or something like that. So um, I thought that uh, you know, I was expecting to see a lot of skyscrapers and yeah. I was pretty disappointed because I was living in uh, Palo Alto, yeah. which I felt like was an underwhelming experience. Uh, but <laughs> as you can imagine, Palo Alto is a pretty expensive area, but I just, I wasn't happy because there wasn't uh, too many skyscrapers. So, okay. um, but yeah, um, so I, I was little, I mean, I came with my dad and I came for tennis, but yeah, I mean, the weather was nice and, uh, uh, when I was sleeping, it was too quiet, so I was like, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> I needed like car noise or something. So I was living in a, um, you know, in a su and not in the suburb, but I lived in a city. Okay. Um, I mean, how tough was it emotionally for you at twelve years old to leave literally everything behind? And were you prepared? I guess. Um, you know, I. <clears throat> I I didn't find it too difficult. I mean, I was traveling already at the time. Right. Um, it's kind of surprising, to be honest. Um, um, well, now. Alert from. Well, one second, sorry. Updates. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So it was. Um, it was a little bit. Uh, sur it's surprising to think of it now because uh, you would think that twelve or like almost thirteen, uh, um, it would be a little bit more difficult, um, you know, to to live on your own, but. Uh, yeah, at the time it wasn't too bad. Um, I was watching a lot of Warner Brother cartoons and Looney Tunes. Yeah. Uh, so I was enjoying it because in Moscow at the time they were showing uh, uh, Disney uh, Disney cartoons uh, only on Sunday, so you had you know you got a chance to watch. Uh, um, I, I, forget, I forget the cartoons, but. You know, you could only watch two of them on Sunday, so I was always looking forward to that. And in the U.S., I was watching them every day <laughs> between yeah. practice. It was pretty exciting. It kept yeah. me busy. I mean, can we go back even further? What are your first memories playing tennis back in Moscow? And how old were you? Um, were you then? Uh, your first tennis tennis experience? Yeah, I think it almost feels like I started playing when I was a fetus. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't even remember. A lot of these things, I mean, they're just very, very small fragments. Um, and to be honest, I mean, I was practicing and I traveled to tournaments with uh, with Igor Andreev, uh, who we played on Pro Tour afterwards, but I didn't remember any of that. You know, I remember vaguely that, you know, me and Michael usually were playing at some tournaments, but so it seems like there's some fragments that I just completely don't remember. and uh, And so... So very few few memories from from young age, but um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it is pretty soon it became to to kind of become you know became my profession. So um, I, I think when you're the young age, sort of having a profession, you know, you, you tend to lose uh, interest in it quite quickly. So um, so and that kind of created a, a bit of a turbulent uh, relationship with, with the sport mm -hmm. um, but you know I sort of kind of got out of it uh, you know closer to the middle of my career you know I, I started liking it again and I started finding things to love about it but yeah for for for, for a period of, of uh, 
of my career, it was more of a job than uh, than a game. Mm. So and that started, you know, a bit earlier than um, um, in, in my, you know, in my career. So probably like around seven or eight or nine. I, I don't really remember the age, but um, before before I came to US, I was already sort of, you know, working hard at it. Mm. Just to go back to your um, your younger days, do you remember like what the conditions were like on the court? Uh, was it hard court, clay courts in Moscow? Um, well, I mean, we had some clay courts uh, in the summer. Uh, yeah. We didn't have too many hard courts at the moment. Um, um, we had some uh, kind of like rubber courts. Uh, right. Well, not like entirely rubber, but it's kind of... Um, trying to think i don't think they have too many surfaces like that in the u.s but yeah basically it is a rubbery surface um on the outside so you know it when it was very warm it it became uh it wasn't it wasn't very exciting to play on because it smelled a little bit and it was uh it's kind of a you know a little soft and gooey and um but um during the winters we had a lot of fast surfaces so it was uh you know, kind of TerraFlex type of surface and, uh, uh, you know, kind of a basketball floor, um, like the wooden. Um, so, like, I remember I was training in uh, in one of these, uh, you know, like, university type uh, gyms where they had the basketball floor and the volleyball floor and they had some, um, um, so it's all in one space, but they just had uh, uh, markings for the basketball, volleyball, uh, badminton, and tennis courts, and so there was about a, you know, a couple of feet of um, backspace b- behind the baseline because the gym wasn't big enough for the tennis court. Yeah. So you know, I remember training in, in, in a couple of uh, gyms like that, and there was a, it was a. I mean, I'm pretty sure right now it would be a surreal experience because the, the, you know, playing on unpolished wood is, is is probably not the best surface to play yeah. on, but uh, yeah. At that time, we were just trying to kind of uh, <laughs> use whatever means we had. Yeah. I mean, people who followed your career would say your highlights would be for sure reaching the top 20, winning Davis Cup for Russia, and winning seven singles career titles. But they'll also say you, you were unlucky with your fair share of injuries as well. How do you look back on your own career? Um, you know, I, I think, um, I mean, in all honesty, I feel like I, I – I had the capability to be much higher than I was. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I think those that kind of watched me play would probably agree with me if I said that I was an underachiever Mm -hmm. uh, for, for my capabilities. Um, Yeah, I I did have some injuries and uh, um, that sort of stalled a lot of progress, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, you sort of look at, what you could have achieved and what you did achieve. So, you know, in that sense, uh, there, there were some good, there's some definitely good moments. Uh, uh, but sort of looking, I, I remember scrolling through some of my results uh, maybe a few months ago, um, just on ATP, you know, like through year by year. Yeah. And um, just looking at all the matches that I've played. And uh, I mean, I don't remember some of them, you know, so I was like, <laughs> I was kind of surprised to remember that I actually played some of these matches. Um, but yeah, you just kind of scroll through it and you, and it almost looks like it's a very, very short career. So, you know, in a sense, um, um, you know, I, I feel like it, you know, it was long uh, overall. You know, it was almost like 10 years, maybe even longer. If you don't count uh, the years that you played, you know, on future circuit and in juniors, because in reality, that's also part of the career. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it, it almost feels like it's such an enormous time, you know, uh, over 20 years of playing tennis. Uh, I mean, probably 30 somewhat years, just total, you know, from the moment that I picked up a tennis racket. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of felt a little bit short in a way, like it, it came, it, it went through pretty fast. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could have done much, much better, but, um, still had, uh, good results and still did better than a lot of other guys did. So mm. you know, I think I'd be hard pressed to, uh, to complain about it. Now you mentioned that you think you're a bit of an underachiever. What do you think held you back? Um, 
I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that when I, uh, now that I'm coaching, it's a lot easier for me to, to look at these things uh, from the outside. And, and I always look at it, you know, I, I, I never look at, at how the person plays or how good they are. I, I sort of look at, you know, how badly do they need it or they want it or they love it. Um, and I, I think I've, I was struggling with that. You know, I, um, I, um, I guess I did, I didn't truly love it. Like in a sense where, you know, I feel like when I watch Rafa play, I feel like, you know, whether he's getting paid or not getting paid, I'm, I'm sure he just, he would play for free or maybe he'd even pay money to play. Yeah. You know, he seems like he truly enjoys it. And then, um, and I think, uh, I think that's very important uh, to really be able to push yourself because at the end of the day, you can push yourself much harder than anyone else can push you. Um, you know, when you're, you know, when you're a junior, then you can have parents push you, you know, maybe your coach pushes you. Um, so a lot of times there's a f sort of fear that, that pushes you along um, to, to get to a certain, you know, to get a certain result. Uh, but as you get older, there, you know, those, that outside mo motivation becomes uh, less uh, impactful on you. So then you just have to push yourself. So if you don't really truly love it, it or if you have some sort of a, a bad relationship with, with what you're doing, um, if it, if it feels more like a job than feels more like a game, then I think it becomes a lot more difficult. You, you know, you take the losses much harder, uh, uh, you know, falling off the horse hurts that much more and it, it makes you, uh, less, uh, um, less willing to get back on it. Um, so I think I was struggling a bit with that, um, you know, and then really kind of had to learn a lot of things on my own, which I guess now helps me quite a bit because I can actually pass that information along. And I didn't, you know, I sort of had to invent a lot of things myself for myself, uh, you know, and, and become creative and, 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 and learn and, a lot of things uh, where a lot of players, I feel, you know, they just get the information told by the coach. So they, they go and they do it, but they don't truly um, uh, assimilate it uh, or they don't absorb it. You know, it doesn't become part of them. They just kind of, they just do things uh, as they're told. Um, yeah. Whereas I had to sort of, um, I think just really kind of, go into into the things and, and learn them and, and, and really understand them. So I, I feel it helps me um, in, in my coaching perspective. Just to go back to your, um, your playing career, your first title was in Mumbai, India 2006. What do you, what do you remember from that week and that final? Oh, shit, man. Um, that thing, uh, so we played the, uh, we played with Andy uh, Roddick on um, on clay in Moscow, like seventeen fifteen. So it was like four hour, fifteen minute match. Yeah. Um, I go into like full body cramp uh, after it. Um, I mean, I was already cramping in the fifth set. I don't know if Andy f was feeling fresh or not, but I was feeling like crap already. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then I literally we go. We, uh, well, I mean, we kind of like went to this, I mean, it wasn't like a nightclub, but we go for dinner and um, I mean, we weren't dancing or you know, doing anything stupid. Um, but yeah, we just had some dinner and, um, you know, like I literally had maybe two or three hours of sl uh, slip, uh, sleep. Yeah. Um, and then I, um, you know, I, I get on the plane, I think I fly like through Milan or something. Um, so I had like two connections, I fly to Mumbai we arrive there at night, uh, get some sleep, you know, we have one day of practice and then, you know, I, I play the, um, my first match and my second match. And, um, you know, I remember there was like these giant bat flying kind of swooping as I'm tossing the ball as I'm going, yeah. you know, as I'm about to serve this freaking thing is like flying right at me. And it's, yeah. uh, and I thought it was like a cat with wings. Like literally it was like, it was, for some reason, I, I, I remember it being very big. I don't know if they get that big, but that thing was like pretty massive. And so I remember like, as I'm serving, I'm like, what the, 
you know. Um, so, yeah, and I had actually a couple of really good matches. I think um, um, I played Robredo, I played uh, Burdich. Um, so it was like 7-6, I think, like in the third. Yeah. I remember they were uh, vacuum. <laughs> they were vacuuming the court to dry it. <laughs> it was pretty hilarious because, like now they dry them with blowers, but you know back then in India, like they didn't have the blowers, so they just came out with a vacuum cleaner, and they were trying to somehow dry it. Um, yeah, so we had a couple of rain delays in the final, but yeah, I ended up winning it, and I feel like I was just kind of going through this whole thing, like mm. almost like an autopilot. I, I mean, so yeah, in the span of two weeks, I had really good results in Davis Cup and then in Mumbai. Yeah. And then right after that, I went to Tokyo and um, there I remember I lost to uh, Hong Tai Lee, I think, in the second round. Mm -hmm. I beat Jimmy Wang in the first. Like, yeah, so, yeah, so it, was a, it was a pretty fun experience, but I think, um, I think uh, the Davis Cup emotionally just took out so much out of me that, you know, I really... I wasn't even like afraid of anything and I was just kind of playing free and wasn't really thinking about anything in Mumbai. Mm. I mean, your last single title was, was in 2011 in Setogenbosch, Netherlands. From your first title in 2006 and your last title in 2011, how different were those two Dimitris? Or I guess, has playing professional tennis changed you as a person over the years? Um... You know, I, uh, I mean, I, I honestly, like, right now, I wouldn't be able to tell you if, if there was, I mean, uh, there was obvious difference, you know, in time, um, yeah. in time frame, I had quite a few injuries in between. Uh, um, I think my Eastbourne title, I was like, literally, I forget what year it was, but, you know, I had a surgery right after that. Um, and uh, so... So obviously, the last title was, you know, I had to deal with a lot of comebacks and sort of a lot of uncertainties and um, and not really knowing how to how to go through that. So mm -hmm. it was a bit of a kind of foreign territory. Um, yeah. I think towards the end of the career, I already sort of knew what to expect. I, you know, I knew that there was going to be like very low lows and um, and um, but yeah, but. Um, so I think there's definitely a lot more experience in, in the way I was playing. And, um, but also I think it was probably one of the better sort of years in terms of playing ability. Like 2006 was just so much confidence, you know, going into 2007, it was like my best year. Um, but I was in really good shape and I just, I felt confident. So there was a, almost like, I wasn't really thinking a lot, you know, it was just, I was just, sort of doing stuff and and i was winning and um you sort of get to that point when you're you know it's like you can't lose because you just you know as you win every match and as you as you're able to battle through some of these kind of tough spots in the match and and come away as a winner mm -hmm. it kind of builds your you know resistance to stress and almost like it becomes like a callus you know mm -hmm. um so um so 2006 was sort of a you know like I was going in afterburner so I was just going through everything but then once you do have these injuries once you sort of get halted and and then you just have to go from zero back to that back to that level again um, yeah that that takes a little bit more sort of uh, experience um, so yeah so I think that that was kind of the main difference um, that, that I could that I could just come that I could think of. Mm. You've had wins over top ten players like Andy Roddick, Ivan Lubitsch, uh, David Ferrer, but which partic which one in particular in your career stands out to you looking back? Um, well, I mean they're all different. Um, you know, with Andy it was a it was a very important match for you know for the team for the country. Yeah. It was Davis Cup, so that's sort of remembered a lot more by, by those who remember me playing. Yeah. Um, with Lubicic, I felt like, you know, it was a comeback from a couple of sets down in, Wim in Wimbledon. Um, and, uh, you know, it was also 
I, mean, I don't remember it too much, to be honest. It was just kind of strange, but um, but in that in that um, in that Wimbledon, I had a couple of matches, you know, where I was down two sets to love. It was against Ivan, and then um, the match that I lost to Neiman, and it was also down a couple of sets, and I came back and I almost were able to. I was almost able to win it. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a little different. Uh, different sort of vibe to it but um uh, what was the third match that you mentioned uh Ferrer. yeah i mean with ferrer i think uh that was where i sort of became a little bit wiser and, and smarter as a player and um and i was also working with with a coach that i really really liked and uh, uh probably my favorite coach um um because i he sort of helped me understand how to play in clay and just, um, yeah. And so, so, you know, playing against David, he just kind of explained me how David plays yeah. and it was a lot easier to sort of play, you know, it's like you're playing with, with uh, sort of navigation that tells you when to turn instead yeah. of trying to play by, um, by instinct. So, yeah, so it was a little bit more easier and I mean, a little bit easier and, um, yeah, I felt like I was more of a, uh, you know, not, not poking in the dark and I was actually, I knew what I was doing in the court. Mm. I mean, you retired in 2017. Was there a specific moment in your career telling you the end was near? Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, in 17 and I tried playing for a few tournaments. Uh, my last, uh, protected was US Open and then after that I played some challengers and um, I mean I knew that to get back I needed to obviously to get to the top 100 you know I needed to do well in a lot of challengers because you know I couldn't I couldn't win matches so I had to go through through the challengers and uh, you know I played qualies in my last tournament um, actually in, in I think most of the challengers I was playing qualies mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I just kept getting injured um, and something was happening with the leg, you know, like, it, you know, just you keep playing and all of a sudden, you know, you feel like you're, like it's a muscle tear and then there's nothing you can do. You have to retire. You can't move. You can't go up the stairs. Yeah. You know, you wait for three, four days. It sort of goes away and, you know, and, and so I was kind of, I was just frustrated because I couldn't figure out, okay, you know, what to do next. Um no one could really tell me what, what the problem was. Mm -hmm. So I, um, you know, so I, I kept kind of uh, playing the next tournament and the same thing would happen in the next tournament. And so the last tournament that I was playing in, which was Stockton, I think, you know, I had, um, I borrowed a car from a friend. So like I wasn't paying for the car, I was just paying for the gas. Yeah. You know, I went there and um, we were paying for the hotel. Um, and, and so I went through qualies. I won like three, four matches and uh, no, no, three matches in qualies. And, um, you know, I, won, I think I won like three matches in, in, in main draw. And uh, I remember I was playing against uh, John, is it John Patrick Smith, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I remember like I, I was having the same problem with the leg, you know, where it's like basically you just, you understand that it's like, you know, it's, it's about, it's, it's about to go, you know, it's about to get that same sort of feeling where you can't, you can't do anything with it. Mm. And, um, and somehow managed to survive it, you know, kind of, um, play around it, you know, not maybe moving too much and, you know, just kind of, but you feel like you're handicapped. You're almost, you always feel like you're, you know, you're playing like with one hand tied behind your back in a way, you know, and then, and so I win that match and, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, for the match with M Michael Moe, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get better. And, of course, sure enough, you know, but I set into it. Um, I land in the surf and the same thing happens. And, and then I, I started understanding that, you know, that to get into top 100, you need to win two, three challengers minimum, you know, and, 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 and have some good results. And maybe a year into it, you know, I'll be back into top 100. But um, obviously, in order to win seven matches in a, in a, in a challenger, I can't do because I can't even play three, four matches without getting injured. Um, and, you know, or I need to travel with, with a fitness coach, with somebody else. 
so you need to take a team with you and I can't and I was just doing everything myself and I was like booking flights and and everything and then I was trying to also have a life outside of tennis and, and I'm like looking at it and I'm like 34 however old I was and I understand that you know it's just not going to happen it's because my you know my whole day is revolving you know you wake up and you're like you have to you know, roll out your, you know, roll out your body and then you got to stretch and you got to go warm up. You got to practice and you got to do this and that and you're paying for everything. And at the end of that Stockton week, like I'm, I'm, I'm breaking even. Yeah. I'm not even making any money. So I'm like thinking, okay, at 34, I'm going to play for a year. I'm going to try to get into top hundred. So I'm going to be 35, yeah. you know, and then what? And then I'm going to play for two years. Hopefully, you know, if everything goes, goes, as well and if i if i don't get injured which is very unlikely because i keep getting injured like every week yeah uh, um so i'm like you know i don't really see any uh, i don't see the light at the end of the tunnel so um you know i could have probably played some doubles and maybe you know if i find the right partner and if i improve my you know volleys and and so on and so on then i could probably stay out on tour but you know i felt like i'm just getting to the age where I don't want to be like a 40 year old guy traveling the circuit and, um, and then have to, you know, at 40 years old, have to start like figuring out what to do in life, you know, cause I'll have to do it anyway. So I figured it's probably a better time now, you know, at least I have a little bit of money saved and, and so I could use, uh, you know, that money to maybe have a year or two transitional period where I can, you know, maybe, give myself a chance to, you know, take it easy and not have to run and go to work right away. Um, so it was more of a just balance, you know, kind of weighing all the options and, and really choosing not to invest whatever I had saved into the career that potentially can never happen. So, um, and I didn't want to stay out on challengers, you know, it's, um, you know, challengers, they don't, they're not very, um, they're not very rewarding, but in terms of the effort that you put in to win, to win them, it's almost like an ATP level. You know, you're going to have a couple of guys from top hundred. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of young guys, you know, everyone wants to kick your ass. So, um, so it's, it, it's a, you know, you obviously can sneak in a couple of matches using your experience. You know, I played against, uh, it was, uh, uh, Felix, uh, I cannot pronounce his last name. Okay. I mean, yeah, Canadian Felix. Yeah, <laughs> uh, played against him in that last tournament. I I beat him like six two, six two, I think, or something like that. I mean, I played really well. I returned well, but he sort of beat himself there a little bit. But you know, you're gonna have a lot of tough matches, and you know, for very little points, uh, very little money, and um, and it's not like it's not just about making money, but you know, money's is what you use to fund the rest of your trip. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, I just really couldn't, uh, couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It was very, very dim. Yeah. I mean, since retiring in 20, since retiring in 2017, you transitioned to coaching. Was coaching always an ambition for you after your playing career finished? You know, I was actually coaching um, in an academy um when i was injured a few yeah. times so which i felt like it helped me i, I coached uh, uh some young kids and I, I was probably you know 18 and you know i had different stages when i was injured so I coached a few times uh, because I, otherwise i would just kill myself like i had nothing else to do and um i was like driving around collecting like <laughs> soda cans and bottles yeah. and <laughs> Uh, recycling them because like <laughs> there's nothing else I could have done yeah. um so yeah so I, I went and I tried to you know try to help and uh and I felt like it was it was actually um it helped me uh, well when I was coaching just the little kids were basically whining and complaining and they were saying exactly the same things that I was saying you know like yeah. they would be playing let's say game to 11 you know and they would be up eight to two and you know, guy would miss like eight times in the fence, and then would hit one in the for a winner. And the, you know, and then if they saw a winner fly by them, they would like run around and scream like, "Oh my God, I'm getting killed!" And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" You know, it's, the ratio is just so outrageous that you know you can't even complain about it. Yeah. And and so I started understanding that you know once you're 
in the moment and you're you know emotionally you you see things a lot a lot different than mm -hmm. w what truly is happening in the court so i s sort of started transferring that into my um into my uh, game and and the things that they were saying back to me and i started seeing a lot of relation to what i was telling to my coach so so i felt like it helped me um you know maybe see it be a little bit i think more even killed and and um um realize that maybe how i feel in the court is not necessarily you know what i feel is happening is not necessarily the reality of it so um so then once i started playing i was a little bit better you know i was i wasn't as uh, as crazy on the court um which you know still crazy but it's <laughs> just yeah not as crazy cool i mean from 2018 till recently you worked with arena sabalenka when was the first time you met her and what were your first impressions? Um, I saw her, uh, well, I was working actually with uh, uh, Visnina, Yelena Visnina at the time. Yeah. Um, and Yelena was playing doubles with uh, uh, Makarova. So they were like, you know, they're one of the top doubles teams and uh, they played against uh, Vika Zarenka in the uh, uh, arena. Yeah. And uh, I remember I was watching the doubles match and and they sort of went uh the girls went at arena a few times you know when she was at the net and you know like i can't i can't say for sure whether they try to peg her but uh but i think yeah, they, they were like trying to you know they went like two or three shots right at her so it looked like they were they were trying to hit her and and you know and so she kind of she was like kind of reflex volleying it and and then she was backing up and then she just felt flat on her butt you know so and she was kind of giggling so i remember like that was kind of my first um impression of her because you know she was actually enjoying and having fun out there which which is uh which is i think how it should have been <laughs> for for me as well but uh, you know i was taking it a lot more serious but um but yeah so so it was kind of um it was an interesting um kind of first memory i guess and how did you start coaching her how did that come about um, you know, she was looking, um, I mean, I stopped working with Yelena in, um, in Miami. She yeah. was pregnant. Uh, well, no one knew at the time, um, I think until she like literally, <laughs> she, like she couldn't hide it anymore, but, um, <laughs> from what I understand, she, I think got pregnant around that time. So, um, she, I think she played maybe a couple more tournaments after Miami and then, uh, I think French open was the last one that she played. Yeah. So anyway, so we stopped in Miami and. I was in Moscow. I wasn't really, you know, I was just kind of coaching um, some juniors, just mm -hmm. kind of here and there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and Arena stopped working with her coach. Uh, French Open was the last tournament, mm -hmm. so um, yeah. So we, we just we started uh, June first, I think was the was the date. Um, so yeah. So we we're trying to prepare for the grass court season. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So that that was. Kind of how we started. I mean, from the outsider's view, it seemed as though your coaching partnership with Arena was a very successful one, but also the split with Arena was rather a difficult and emotional one. Can you walk us through what caused the end of the relationship? Um, well, I mean, you know, kind of, uh, you know, so I, I, I think just you know, when I started coaching, like my idea was like, you know, how do I become kind of the coach that I wanted myself to have, you know, so that, that was always sort of my understanding, you know, of, of what kind of coach I want to be. And, mm -hmm. and so I went, you know, through kind of a long and, uh, you know, through a long time in my career, you know, through some difficult times. And, and I remember how, like, I needed someone there, you know, during the tough time. And, you know, I've done some mistakes, of course, along the way. And, and, had to take kind of responsibility for some of them, but um, I absolutely felt like I needed someone there to tell me, you know, how to become a bit better player and a person. And, and so I try to kind of be that as a coach and kind of be a blend of all the, you know, good qualities of the coaches that I sort of liked working with. And, um, you know, and if it meant like to do, you know, if it, to help to do laundry, then that's what you do. You know, if, it, if you need to be there as a friend, then you have to be there as a friend and, and, and so I feel like, 
you know, I, I believe like that's the only way you can really make an impact, um, you know, to have a friendship and, and a trust and, um, and everything else is, I feel is just a bit superficial. Um, so, you know, of course there has to be like a respect as well. And, and, you know, I, I don't do well without respect and I, you know, I don't do well with betrayal and all that stuff. And, um, you know, and it's on and off the court. I feel like it's, it's a bit of a relationship. Um, you know, it's very, very difficult to have just a good relationship on the court uh, with someone that you don't really like, or you don't trust. And, and, and so I think it's very difficult a lot of times to find the right coach, you know? Um, so, um, um, you know, and so we started, uh, started kind of, I think we became friends, you know, I really liked her as a person. I felt, you know, I, I was actually kind of quite envious of, of how she was, uh, um, you know, because she truly enjoys it and she really wants, you know, to be the best and, and she has this motivation and drive and, and, um, and so I, you know, kind of envious of that. And then it was, obviously it's pretty easy to work with someone like that, um, you know, who's very strongly motivated to, to become better. Mm. Um, and, um, and so, you know, my job was obviously to help her on the court, you know, to kind of fill the, the knowledge gap. Um, but also I felt like, you know, off the court, you need to help as well. You can't, uh, you know, you, you can be, uh, um, can be like an a-hole off the court and be a great sport on the court, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, so I, I feel like all the top players, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty decent people off the court. Um, or at least they're, you know, they might not be like the most friendly people, but, but they're always, um, they're quite well attuned to what's going on around them. You know, they're, they're very knowledgeable. They, they always try to, or they strive to be better and, and, you know, you talk to Roger, I mean, he can talk about anything. He, he'll talk about a couch design just as well yeah. as he can talk about it for him. Um, so it means that they're well-rounded people and, and they're trying to, you know, they're, they're always seeking information. They're always seeking to get to be better. So I feel that, you know, my job as a coach is to help a person grow off the court as well as on the court, um, you know, and then, um, um, so, so I think that that was kind of the, you know, that's how our relationship was starting. Uh, you know, I was kind of helping her uh, with a lot of things. Um, and then, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, I think recently she, maybe she felt like it's, uh, there's really not much else that I can give her. You know, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, I mean, it was obviously the right decision for her. You know, if, if she feels like there's nothing that she can take from me, then it's time to move on. You know, as a coach, you have to believe that there's nothing personal in that decision and yeah. business is business in the end. And, you know, it's obviously painful and not to be able to help or, you know, um, and, um, you know, but I, I feel like, a, you know, to look on the positive side, you know, I've always done things that, you know, with the best of intentions and, you know, I gave my best. So in that sense, I know that I've, uh, there's really not much else I could have done. You know, I've done pretty much everything I could have done. Um, and, uh, you know, you feel a bit amputated in a way when the split happens, but kind of that's life, you know, and you can't help if, uh, you know, if you don't have enough experience as a coach, you just, um, yeah, you just have to kind of, uh, you know, you, you can do only what you can do. And uh, I have to, I have to agree. The results were still pretty decent, you know, yeah. but you know, I think she has the right team in the place, you know, she has good people around her. So, you know, they're supportive and I'm sure they'll give her like a very good advice and what, you know, and what's, what, what direction to take from this point forward. So, I mean, I know Dieter a bit and we have a few chats with him and he was quite a good player at the, uh, um, when he was playing and he's a good guy and so I, you know, I feel like he can do a really good job and she, he has a he has a good experience working with the big name players so it should be a good f collaboration for them okay. and what's next for Dimitri 
Are you looking for another um, player to coach full time on tour? Um, you know, I, I mean, I think I'll take some time to reassess in which direction to head and, um, you know, sort of learn from my mistakes, uh, try to get better at what I do, you know, and, um, you know, if there will be some offers from players who would like to improve and feel that I'm the person who can help them achieve higher grounds. And, you know, of course I'll be very glad to to help, Mm. but, um, I feel I feel happy when I'm appreciated, um, as we all are. (laughs) And, and nowadays, like, you know, I I just want to feel happy. Um, you know, the, the whole me and tennis relationship thing wasn't truly like a love story. So, you know, kind of similar, like with Andre, I guess, uh, Andre Agassi. Um, but you know, I respected the tennis and I'm thankful for, you know, what I got from it, but, uh, I wasn't entirely happy when I played. So, now I would like to have a job that makes me happy and, you know, makes me want to get out of bed in the morning. So last couple of years, I was pretty happy, you yeah. know, even though it was pretty difficult. So, so I'm just going to look for something that's going to make me happy. And would the Russian Davis Cup captaincy um, be a role that you're interested in? <laughs> Are you offering? <laughs> uh, I mean, if someone offered you, if the feder- Federation offered you? You know, I... Um, I would take it only if, if I feel, you know, and that's my problem. I think a lot of times I question myself a lot more than I should. And, um, you know, I, I, I would take it only if I feel like I can be of help. Mm. I really don't want to do something, you know, I don't want to take something up, you know, just, just to claim that, Oh, I've done this and I'm, yeah. I'm a Davis cup captain. Yeah. You know, it, um, if I can, if, if I can do it well, then I would do it. Um, mm. But again, you know, I have to feel there's a, you know, I have to feel like, you know, there's a feedback where people say like, you know, they they appreciate it and they feel like I'm helping them. Yeah. And I feel like to, to me, that's the worst thing is then when, you, when you're doing something and you're pouring your heart into it and then you hear that, you know, that's not good enough or yeah. something is not right. And then that kind of really knocks the wind out of, out of my sails. So, mm. um, so hopefully, uh, whatever it is that I choose to do, yeah. um, you know, that I feel that, uh, that I'm really good at doing it. Mm. The last couple of questions, I know we're um, running a bit over time, but if you could coach any up and coming player on tour, who would you want to perhaps coach? You know, I, um, I think, I mean, I, I, since since I was working on women's tour, I um, obviously know a lot more players on, on women's uh, circuit. I haven't really watched too many guys. Okay. So, you know, if I had to, and, and I, I, I actually am quite honest about it. I've, I've been telling it to a lot of people. I feel like uh, Caroline Garcia, even though she's not up and coming, I feel like she could be much, much better. And I feel like she's a very good athlete. She's a harder worker. Um, I feel like she's uh, definitely you know, kind of a, a stock that can go way up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I feel like Muguruza is, a, is another good example of, you know, I feel like she could be um, a lot better, but there I'm, I'm just focusing more like on technique, you know, um, I feel like for her height and her, you know, her, um, her size, I think she could be much, much uh, bigger player than she is. Um, and, you know, you can see how, she gets away with a lot of hard work and, you know, she's almost like two meters tall, but she, she almost like plays a little bit like, uh, like Diego Schwartzman, you know, she's such a hard worker and yeah. um, she doesn't have to be short rallies, even though I think she should, you know, she should have a bomb of a serve, yeah. but it might be a little too late for her to start changing things. You know, it's, it's very difficult at that age to change some stuff. Um, so those are like two off, of, off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, good potential um out there i feel like uh right now um a lot of the young generation is is a little bit more difficult to work with i feel like they become financially independent uh so quickly that it's very difficult for them to to accept criticism um Mm. which you need to accept in order to improve you know it's not criticism for sake of criticism it's criticism kind of constructive criticism and, and a lot of times constructive criticism is 
uh, is taken in the wrong way. Um, and it happens a lot with some of the ATP players as well. I know there's a couple of guys that, that are just haven't been able to really embrace, uh, you know, criticism in that way. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, I think I wouldn't be far off if I said that Nick Kyrgios could be one of those guys that, that could improve um, tremendously, you know, and he, and he would, he would be able to, to be top five quite easily, but, you know, I, I think that rebellious sort of um, uh, approach in, in his life is, is sort of, it's helping him and it's hurting him. I feel like it, you know, this way he protects himself a little bit, you know, where he kind of has this uh, appearance of not caring too much. Yeah. I think he cares a lot more than, than, than he truly shows. Mm. But I think that's what a lot of the younger generation does. They, they sort of mask themselves, you know, they, they put on the, a facade of, of some, some, someone that they're truly not. And so that kind of hinders them from improving and hinders them from facing their own sort of demons and, and trying to, um, to kind of improve and change for the better. Mm. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good players, obviously. Um, I mean, Shapovalov is a good one. Um, um, I haven't seen Yannick Sinner play, but you know, he's doing well and, you know, obviously, if he's doing well, he's definitely got a good situation. Yeah. Uh, I say that if, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. <laughs> yeah. You know, nothing that, uh, you know, I don't think you should, you should really um, go into, um, into someone's, uh, you know, career and try to, yeah. you know, uh, for sure. I'm sure Yannick, Yannick has a very good situation. Um, and, I really, I don't know, you know, it, you know, when you travel in circuit, you see a lot, you know, on guys circuit, you see a lot more of the guys with girls. Um, who else is the younger one? I, I remember Marta Kastuk was, was yeah. very, very good player. I mean, incredible uh, in terms of athleticism. Yeah. You know, I feel like Diana Istremska is the same way. Very athletic, yeah. very good, but uh, man, they're, you know, sometimes you wonder what exactly, <laughs> what exactly they're thinking about, you know, on day-to-day -day basis, because mm -hmm. they're just, uh, you know, Kastuk has been stuck in the same spot for such a long time. And, and, uh, and you know, that it's not her physical ability, you know, so it has to be something else. And, it, um, you know, and then, and, you know, you wonder what well, that could be. <laughs> yeah. And you wonder if you're able to help with that at all, because, yeah. you know, like I, like I was saying earlier, you know, you can be just a coach on the court, but, I mean, there's so much things off the court that can affect the way you play. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's approach in life. It's being professional. It's, uh, it's, you know, giving up certain things um, and making sacrifices and, and not making them just, you know, on paper or just saying them out loud. It's actually truly giving up things that don't really help you. Mm. Um, and, um, and really just submerge yourself into, um into what you do i feel like the top four guys that's what they've done you know roger and rafa and novak and, and andy i mean they live and breathe the the sport which is very difficult because there's so much um temptation outside of it um and those four guys could probably afford anything in life but they still you know they you know they go they go back out they they work hard they they're always they're always trying to see how they can improve and and um, and I feel like um, very, there's very few girls that they're able to do that and I feel like maybe that's why there's so much changing and and you know there isn't a domination on women's circuit as much as there is on this circuit because uh, some of these girls they just do really well and then they just fall off the face of the you know face of the earth um, yeah. you know Sloan Stevens in the the US Open and then she couldn't like win a first round for 11 for 11 tournaments mm. which is seems just impossible but yet it happened so yeah so I, 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 you know it's it's a little bit more difficult I think uh, for, for the girls yeah. Uh, but yeah but so yeah so I'm not sure who I would I would be able to help and but you know if, if there is someone who's who needs the help and you know and and not just saying it, but actually, you know, when you, when you come on the court, you really feel like the person is really, you know, putting in the effort or if they're just, if they're just, um, you know, uh, 
putting on a facade. Mm. I mean, just, I want to quickly touch on Nick Kyrgios because you mentioned that, I, I mean, I was asking that, can you relate to him in a way? Because he's been open about his love-hate relationship with tennis and you mentioned that at the start that you had a bit of a love-hate relationship with tennis as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I don't know his story, you know. Um, I mean, I, I could be way off the map, but I feel like he's he really cares about it. Okay. Um, but when you care about it, and when you admit it, um, I think losing hurts. And, and all of a sudden, um, you know, it's sort of like the, it's like why people tank, you know, they tank because it becomes uh, easier to deal with the loss when you sort of act like you don't care. Yeah. Because when you lose, you just, you can always tell to yourself or to somebody else, you say, well, you know, I, didn't, I really didn't want to win that match. Because if I wanted to, I could have won it. So to me, it feels like he's doing a little bit of that. It's, it's a bit, I mean, I can't say it's childish because a lot of people do it, but, but it is an immature way of, of, of facing, facing the problems, you know, mm -hmm. by, by just pretending like you don't care about the outcome. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and so I understand that. Um, I mean, we all go through that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of junior tournaments happen that way, you know, and, you know, someone loses the first set, throws a tantrum, and then just, you know, starts tanking, starts hitting balls over the fence and yelling at their parents and whatever, you know. And, and so maybe maybe he's dealing with some sort of pressure that he can't, you know, it's, that's his kind of, a, um, you know, it's kind of his blow off valve. You know, when mm -hmm. there's too much pressure, you just, you know, he just throws a tantrum. He just does something stupid, sort of undermines his own... Uh, um, uh, success. Mm. Um, so, you know, but only he truly knows, you know, what, what he's feeling, what he knows, and, and maybe even him, you know, maybe he himself doesn't really, he can't put it into words. So I think it's something that he could probably look into uh, to improve, yeah. you know, because his, obviously his physical ability isn't, isn't the problem, right? It's not the handicap. It's not, the, it's not what hinders him. Um, but to be consistent on day-to-day -day basis and be professional um, means that you really have to commit. And, and when you commit, when you put in everything you have mm. and you lose, it actually becomes so painful that uh, it's a lot easier to just block it out and not to deal with it. Uh, I remember some losses where, you know, where I felt like I really put in everything I had and I lost. It, you really can't help but just, you know, you know it makes you want to cry all the time. And so it's, so I think when it's so difficult and it's so painful to lose, um, you find ways how to not put yourself into that situation emotionally. So, you know, and then that's what you, that's what happens a lot of times. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's something that he's going through. Mm -hmm. I, I, for some reason, every time I watch him do something, something stupid, you know, throw a chair or, or do something between the legs, I feel like it's just, you know it's like a little kid who's just afraid of losing <laughs> but i don't know I, I could be way off the base yeah you know i feel like uh you know there's a couple of players that, that seem to do that you know beno Pair is a little bit like that and um um but you know i <laughs> i'd be surprised if i'm right because uh you know then i would really pat myself on the back uh, uh but um uh, but yeah if uh, i mean he's definitely I think he's good for the sport, you know, yeah. as, as much as people kind of bash on him. I mean, he's, he's definitely has some style. He has some flair, um, you know, and I'm hoping to God that he doesn't do it just to kind of please the fans mm. um, because, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to play a role that everyone wants you to, 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 you know, everyone expects you to be an idiot. So you play, you know, you act like an idiot. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that he does it because, you know, he, I mean, he's obviously likes to entertain, and, and yeah. that's a good thing. But you know, it'd be good to see him um, sort of um, maybe allow himself to put in more effort and not get hurt by it emotionally if if it doesn't work out, mm -hmm. because I think that will allow him to be a little bit more consistent with the results and uh, and challenge some of these top guys. Um, I mean, he has the game. You know, he's he's proven he's able to beat them, but. Um, yeah, it's kind of like in, in, in poker, you know, you can, you can bluff a lot, but in the end, the person who wins is 
probably the one that plays percentages. So, um, you know, he could be the guy that uh, not only bluffs a lot, but also maybe put in a little bit more percentages into his game and, and, and really be dangerous. Any final thoughts, uh, Dimitri? I know you mentioned that you haven't watched a lot of men's tennis, but who on the Russian men's side is impressing you the most? Uh, I would say Medvedev, um, because he just looks like someone who should not be playing tennis. Yeah. Like, you know, he's kind of, he's very tall, lanky, uh, doesn't look like he's, he should be very stable or very fast around the court. I mean, he looks a little bit uh, kind of awkward and, um, and his game is, you know, I mean, you can't say that it's, you know, very fluid and, you know, effortless like Rogers, but, but I mean, the, the thing that is, that is amazing is he's just, he's not going to be, he, it almost looks like he can't miss when it's, when it's important, you know? So, um, he finds a way to put the ball in the court, you know, with some, you know, weird spins and, 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 and it's, um, you know, it shows that you can you can really have a perfect technique. You can have everything great. You know, you can have brand new socks and brand new racket with the logo on it. You know, like how a lot of uh, club players come out. You know, with the new Roger bag, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> they think that's going to really do well. But uh, but at the end of the day, it's it's really about you know forcing yourself to to you know put that extra ball in, and, and um, it's it's kind of interesting to watch. I mean, I think he's. Uh, he's got his own unique style and it's um yeah you know, i don't know how he did it but um i played against him once and uh, when he was just up and coming and we had like a very very close match and um and he to be honest you know i think he lost it i didn't really win it i mean i just stayed in it long enough to where you know he sort of made some mistakes because he was much younger but um uh, but yeah i mean he's um he was an interesting player to play against because it just, he felt a little bit like a mix of kind of like a Bernard Tomic, you know, where, yeah. you know, he's got some awkward spins and, you know, it doesn't really, you can't really understand what the hell is happening. And, um, um, but yeah, I mean, he's, uh, he finds a way to win with his head. I mean, imagine if you put that onto some, someone like Nick Kyrgios, I mean, that would be a deadly combination. Mm. What about other players like um, Kachanov and uh, Rublev? I mean, they're obviously good players, you know, and Hachanov had some good results as well. I mean, I mean much better than I had. Uh, yeah. So, you know, he's a uh, bit, but I feel like, you know, he's, he's not as dramatic as Medvedev to me, you know, and then Rublev is, uh, you know, he's a very big hitter. Um, I mean, we played it with, together. We um, played some doubles. Um, he's, I think he's kind of more of the, <laughs> I call him a bit like, uh, you know, I call him Tweak, you know, from South Park. Yeah. Uh, where he's kind of, you know, he, he's a little jumpy, you know, but he's, uh, I, I think like this, this whole, uh, um, um, him working with, uh, what's his name, with Fernando uh, Vicente has helped yeah. him a lot because I think Fernando is kind of the opposite, you know, he's kind of like the, the the water to to the fire you know he yeah. cools him down a little bit so I, it's um, i think it's a very very good combination and um i don't know how they found each other but i feel like it's a very good combo because yeah. i just i know andre is very kind of jumpy you know yeah. and then um I, I can't find the right word for it but i guess jumpy is kind of the best one i can find um so yeah he's kind of very very quick to light up and um and i think it's you know, it's good to have someone very, very calm and kind of, you know, like a Akuna Matata style coach. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, just, I mean, they're just, they were always good players and juniors. And, um, and I think it's the meditative that kind of came out of nowhere, you know, with, with his kind of, uh, you know, hack, hacker club player. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he's he's a bit of a troll too. I, I find like the way he's playing, it almost like he trolls people a little yeah. bit. So um, he's <laughs> he's kind of funny to watch. Uh, great chat, Dimitri. Thanks a lot. Um, I really enjoyed that. By the way, um, one last thing before you go. So um, for the start of the podcast, can you just introduce yourself? So um, can you say hi? I'm Dimitri Tersonov, and you're listening to the Double Bagel. Just for the start of the podcast. Okay. okay. Um, hi. 
my name is uh, Dmitry Tursnov, and you're listening to podcast from Double Bagel. All right, cheers, Dmitry. Thanks so much. Sorry, we've gone, um, we've gone like literally half an hour of the time. Sorry about that. No problem. All um, right. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot, Dmitry. All right. Cool. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Yep.